Welcome to Labor Lens. I am Sharon Ijasson. On this week's edition of the program, we'll be focusing on the challenges health workers are faced with in the country as Joe Su rejects the composition of the Presidential Committee on Health Reforms. We will be right back. <music> Nigeria's organized private sector is seeking further clarification from the government on the tax authority to remit their August value-added tax, which falls due September 21st. The OPS comprises Manufacturers Association of Nigeria, MAN, Nigeria Association of Chambers of Commerce, Industry, Mines and Agriculture, NASIMA, Nigeria Employers Consultative Association, NECA, Nigeria Association of Small-Scale Industries, NASI, and Nigeria Association of Small and Medium Enterprises, NASME. At a joint news conference in Lagos, the LPS, led by Taiwa Deni, said the consequences of the current VAT war between the Federal Inland Revenue Service and some state governments portends a grave danger for the business community and the fragile economic recovery being witnessed in Nigeria. The LPS noted that although the FIRS is relying on the VAT Act 1993 to collect taxes throughout the country, the judgment in August 2021 delivered by a federal high court in Port Harcourt and the subsequent pronouncement by the appeal court asking the parties involved to maintain the status quo has put businesses in a state of confusion. The ongoing situation creates an environment of uncertainty which will not only affect business competitiveness, but also its sustainability. We are merely collecting agents in this matter and should not suffer while offering this pro bono service. It is important to also note that the time when businesses are clamoring for stimulating and reduction of, body, of tax bodies, the ongoing challenge has the potential to make businesses pay double VAT in view of the demands of the FIRS and state governments for remittance of VAT. More so, as the deadline for remittance of VAT collection falls due on 21st of every month, businesses as the collecting agents are practically unclear on authority to remit to and without a clear path. This would further aggravate the pain on businesses. The Food, Beverage and Tobacco Senior Staff Association has called on the federal government to look into the issue of casualization of workers in Nigeria. This was said at a conference in Lagos, Nigeria, as the president of the union said that more than 50% of the workforce in the food sector are casual workers. The union also warned the federal government against the introduction of excise duty on non-alcoholic carbonated drinks. A particular company A, for instance, maybe you have 10 lines. Each of these lines can accommodate, let's say, 20 or 30 thereabouts. Okay, you find out that out of these 30, maybe 10 of the 30 are permanent staff, others are casuals. Okay, so if you now look at it, you now see that there is a deliberate attempt to extinguish the permanent staff, replacing them with a source. So what we are saying is no to this. It's not going to happen. Okay, it's not going to happen because Profit, yes, as good as it may, profit shouldn't be the first consideration. First, you are dealing with human being. And I tell you, it is the human being that turns your capital into the profit that we're talking about. So every stakeholder must be treated accordingly. Do we say they are really on strike? Uh, because uh, as uh, one of the person that uh, goes to government hospitals prior to this time the government hospital seems not to exist 
in some places you have infrastructure without facility or without personnel. Uh, now having the number of personnel trying to see how we can salvage ourselves from the current issue of COVID, not even available at their decks for advice because when you get to most government hospitals, the vaccines are not there, the drugs are not there. Uh, you are referred to specialist hospitals which are run by these doctors. You know even government agencies and government individual patronizes private health facilities. So now having the poor man that grapple with nothing to grapple with this uh, incessant strike or current strike by the medical medical personnel shows clearly uh, that uh, what we, the government swore to, which is to protect the life and security of, in, of individuals, they are feeling that responsibility. And it, the, the effect is obvious. It's just because we don't have statistics, I'm sure we'll have had a number of people that have been dropping dead, that are sick, all some of this. And we know that we're now going to have medical tourism, both from the medical doctors and also from the people that require medical care. If you go to many public hospitals, you will see an influx, I mean, of people out of public hospitals going to, private, to the private hospitals. And that's for people who can afford services in the private hospital. What of the very poor, the indigents, who cannot afford, you know, uh, the exorbitant, you know, charges in the private hospitals? So you will see that uh, it's not the best that should happen to us. So I'm not happy about it. Authorities, they are not doing enough. You imagine negotiations upon negotiations. I've never seen any sign of sincerity on the part of government, the federal government, to resolve this matter, you know, because what these people are agitating for, this, this is not something that is new. It started long time ago, but when government, you know, entered freely into agreements and you don't want no such agreements, so you create, you know, opportunity for this kind of situation. Now the government is saying, go back to work, with this will be done, that will be done. So, and at the end of the day, you, real, you realize that, you realize that uh, the medical doctors don't trust the government any longer. So they refuse to go to work. Even when there is matter in the industrial court, you see that there is not the right the kind of spirit you want to see on both sides, I mean the government and the the medical workers. But the medical workers, it is sure, they don't trust people in government any longer and that's not too good. On the profile interview segment this week, I will be speaking with the national president of the Medical and Health Workers Union of Nigeria, who also doubles up as the chairman of JOSU. He brings us up to speed on the 15 days ultimatum that has been issued to the federal government, following their demands not met in the sector. We will be right back. It's good to have you on the program. It's a pleasure having you once again. Happy a long while. And congratulations on your coronation as the the royal your royal no, majesty. No, installation, installation. Installation. Okay. Okay. In Bayelsa State. Yeah. Congratulations, sir. Um. Congratulations. If people must be lucky, you know. Okay, very quickly, looking at the issues that um, Nigeria is faced with, especially in the healthcare sector, you happen to be the chairman of JOSU, and uh, most recently there was a press release um, that um, was issued by your office, which indicated that um, you were rejecting the composition of the new Presidential Committee on Health Reform. Can you bring us up to speed on what your reaction is? Uh, verily, you have seen our official reaction, and uh, I want to stand on that. The reason is because uh, the committee, in spite of the fact that it is lopsided by a particular professional group, you know, on all sides, we also have spotted the hole that in a health system, in a health system where human resource involvement is key, right? Human resource involvement is key. And here you have now taking out all the registered trade unions that would have given valuable inputs as regards the human resource problems. 
And you all know that most of the issues is because of the lack of understanding of how to manage the personnel. And if you have taken out these organizations that the, 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 the government has deemed fit to legally register, mm -hmm. to manage these aspects of life, the workers, the workforce, you keep them out and you say you want to discuss only technicalities. I think that is a doomed effort. So what do you think the president um, can do about this situation or maybe the relevant stakeholders can do to ensure that we have um, workers represented in this um, presidential committee on, for reform? Um, I think it's not a, a difficult job. The unions that make up JOSU in the health sector are five registered unions and then APA is a conglomerate of the professional associations. Which comprises of more than 95% of, of... Yeah, of the workforce. Yeah, that's, that's the area. In a democratic society, we are representative, you know, approach is key. You now take out a, a small portion to, to represent the whole. That is not how it, it is done. And it means we are not set to really achieve, you know, good results or change the problems as they are. Like I said, um, the professional associations, we have over 30 professional associations in the health system. So far, they've taken just about four. But by taking the registered unions alongside, we're not saying they should drop those four. They are also, yes, some of them, they are all part of JOSU. But you don't create a dichotomy trying to solve a problem. The other professional associations that are not invited now will be seeing themselves as not recognized. But if you are taking JOSU and alongside the, the, the associations, the professional associations that they have taken, JOSU, you know, cuts across virtually all the remaining, you know, 20 plus professional groups. And that's why you see, if you take the five registered trade unions and APA, you have gone a long way to get real good input as it affects the welfare and then the ethics of health services. Joesu issued a 15 um, days ultimatum to the government. Um, there's been a few meetings or more meetings that maybe we may not be aware of, but I know that um, Joesu has been meeting with um, the federal government on um, the issues that might be at hand and why would you want to go on strike? And can you also bring us up to speed on um, the reactions? Is there any green light? Do you think that the strike would actually commence after the expiration of the ultimatum that has been issued? Mm, I think uh, not very many meetings yet. We have had one after our ultimatum. We have had one in the, with the Minister of Labor. And another was held yesterday at the Federal Ministry of uh, Health. And uh, I want to say that uh, there has not been any sign of significant or reasonable seriousness. Reasonable seriousness. Driving from or riding from the background, they kept all they kept saying is, you know, the president does not want a strike, the president does not want a strike. Who wants a strike? We are not lovers of strike. We are not trigger happy with strike. We have been patient. We've been patient for like a year. All right? And if our patience cannot be rewarded, our patience cannot be rewarded with, with, with unsolicited resolution of the issues. And then you wait until we give 15 days ultimatum, and now we give 15 days ultimatum, you are not within the 15 days ultimatum, not willing to even solve these problems. Well, we still have uh, one more meeting, Thursday. By resolving, we give them five minimum demands out of uh, about 17 demands. But if the government um, refused to shift grounds, what would be the next um, line of action? Then they have uh, led us into temptation. And so it is them again that will deliver the nation from the evil of that temptation they have led us into. But you know that at the moment, um, the medical um, doctors are actually on strike. Um, what Don't you see this as, as um, something that will bring um, a total collapse in the healthcare sector in Nigeria? I, to be very candid, uh, Sharon, you know us, you know JSU. 
strike is a part we don't really like to take. But any time we embark on strike, we are being forced into it. What does it take for the government to just adjust conscience for us? We have been on this conscience issue since 2014. 2017, we signed an agreement on first. We signed an agreement. September 30th, to be precise. This ought to have been fulfilled in five weeks. And the government did not do that. Then talk about the hazard uh, negotiation. I would say, well, there was some you know, advancement in terms of the uh, routine hazard negotiation. But we have not concluded yet, even on that. So as we speak of all the issues, talking about the court judgments as the ARD, uh, ADRO you know, resolutions that we got from the consent judgment and all that, we have not made any conclusive ending of any of the issues. Okay, there is this um, issue of no work, no pay that um, is always issued most times when workers want to embark on industrial action. I remember very clearly that in 2018, um, the industrial action was suspended abruptly. Can you tell us if anything has changed? And for the workers that um, were probably um, offering other uh, professional services but were not working and, uh, at that point in time because they are their welfare demands were not met. Can you tell us if these workers uh, actually um, have been paid the um, salaries of those months? I know I remember very clearly about maybe two months' salaries. Have they been paid? Um, not yet. And that is why we have said there is huge dishonesty in the application of no work, no pay. If they really say that no work, no pay is a law, okay, did you apply it to everybody? The answer is no. Sectors have been on strike for months and months and months. Even when they issue letters, they withdraw, they withdrew the letters. All right? But for Joesu, it has been implemented. Even when the government invited us to fight crime, and we were fighting crime and we, we, we went on strike to, you know, to, to see how we can defeat crime, our people were punished for it. That's one thing again that I'm concerned about. about. There are a lot of, a lot of uh, states right now whereby they don't have enough healthcare professionals to actually handle them. We have lots of people that have relocated out of the countries. There are so many states right now, as we speak, that the number, the ratio of patients to um, healthcare professionals attending to them is right is quite poor. Um, what do you think can be done? How can the government address this issue? I think uh, you see, if I have 55 years. If I'm 55 years old here, okay, and uh, I know I have five years to go, and if I take these five years out to countries where people are better remunerated, the working conditions are better and all that, five years, I still have another additional five years where they have 65 years. So that's one thing that has been enticing people. When they get to a point, they start leaving. They start leaving. Even the young ones are also living because the prospects there are not really encouraging, are not enticing. Health service is humanitarian service, we know. But for the humanitarian service provider to be humane and give that humanitarian service, he must be humanely cared for too. By the provider of the care, of the caregiver, which is the government. So until you try to make us believe that the difference between here and outside this country is not much. Even if there is a difference, then you now see most of us that are here just, you know, are going in an extreme exhibition, or exhibition of extreme patriotism. That's why you are still seeing people. Lots of the people that are living, not that they are not patriotic, but they have reached the point, the breaking point, and they can no longer Content. Looking at the fact that there are so many agreements that um, the government is yet to meet up with, um, do you think that probably if um, the welfare of workers in the sector is being improved upon, perhaps it will be more encouraging for workers to stay back and then practice? Certainly, the hope of the worker not leaving is if government is gradually you know, improving this, you know, the welfare, the service co content of the workers. All right? 
that will always give hope to the people that they will continue to stay. But where a government has decided to become a breaker of agreements and then um, a draconian suppressor of the voices of you know, protest, like by using, you know, discriminately using uh, no work, no pay, even when they have broken the law. Even when they have broken the law, an agreement is entered. Legitimate strike is called. 15 days legitimate time is given. You could not resolve this issue. When the persons, now, the persons begin to cry, they begin to make uproar. You say the only way is to suppress them. And when you take suppression into its maximum as it is today, to the maximum level as it is today, uh, you can't really tell people that they must stay behind to be slaves. As far as we are concerned, the introduction of the, the, the no work, no pay is a huge aspect, a significant aspect of the reintroduction of slave labor. Slave labor. You've entered into an agreement with me since 2017. You've not implemented the agreement. I complain, you say you have no work, no pay. What about the no pay, no work? Because you are owing me some months, I mean, in some cases, we didn't go to strike. There are some places where people are owed, workers are owed salaries. They have not gone on strike. They've been carrying out their duties. They've been borrowing to pay transports. And the day, the period they say, oh, we have lacked the money to come to work. You now say, you don't want to pay them. You now hinge on such flimsy excuses. So you are rather introducing slave labor. COVID-19 pandemic is still ravaging the world. Um, I'm aware that um, the medical professionals also receive um, adequate added allowance. Would you want to do a comparison to what, um, what the healthcare workers are actually um, receiving? Would you say that they are receiving um, enough? And also looking at the fact that um, um, many of these health workers don't have enough personal protective equipment, what do you think needs to be done? Um, in reality, I want to say that uh, it's uh, appalling. Members have actually been complaining about uh, the inadequacy of uh, PPEs. But uh, again, that goes to really mark the Nigerian health worker out again. Out, when I say out, as a giant. Because in spite of these lackings, we have complained. We as unions have also done our part. We are doing our part to see how we can mitigate the situation. But then, they are never enough for our people. But because of that patriotism, you are still seeing health workers carrying out these services. So even for that alone, that patriotism alone, government ought to give the issues of the health workers priority attention, priority attention. Ought to have given us priority attention, but of course, Every year, whenever we, we, we give ultimate for one year, when we suspended for one year, nobody wants to talk about that. Nobody talked about these issues. Not that we have stayed quiet, we've been writing to them, we've been trying to engage them. Even the National Assembly, we've been writing, none has intervened in this matter. But whenever we, we now issue an ultimatum, then they begin to play the country against the health workers trying to blackmail the health workers as if the health workers are insensitive. Now you judge. Between Juesu members who suspended an action about a year ago to this day, and the government that had not solved even one of these issues, key issues to date, who is insensitive. Remember, 2020 March, the commander-in-chief, we met with the commander-in-chief, and the Commander-in-Chief gave matching order, directive, go and resolve these issues with Joesu till date. The President's order has been flouted. They have not resolved any of these issues. The key issues, they've not resolved. Both the Ministry of Health and Ministry of Labor have not. It's not that they are not solving problems of other, other, other groups. They are. But for Joesu, they have not solved any. Any of the significant issues, they have not. So now, but today, they want to play it on us. Oh, the, president's, uh, the president has appealed that uh, even those who are contemplating strike should, uh, uh, revert, uh, to, uh, that should reverse their plan and all that and that. For one year, 
the same president gave you order to go and resolve these things amicably. And you have not resolved them. And you want to play that on us? The president will hear us. And when there is strike, the place runs 100%. So those that don't have money to pay are the ones that suffer. Um, when there is strike, in the private uh, health institutions... You pay the public facility. Well, I don't think uh, they are that much yet. They try, that's what they're trying to do. By the minds of Nigerians to support privatization of the public health institutions so that the private people, the, the, the poor masses, will have nowhere to go. Maybe uh, the poor masses will decide to go to, go to the Babalaos and uh, somewhere and the uh, <laughs> traditional, traditional medicine. Is that where we are heading? The, the poor masses will go there. Is that where we are heading to? I think that is the philosophy. The poor masses, um, after all, uh, greening your backyard, Maybe some bitter leaf and other things that you know. Some people say they chew. They want to. They want to encourage everybody to be. <laughs> you know, that is not my recommendation anyway. But uh, to be very candid, it's really disheartening. The public health institutions can be made to function like the private ones. Let me give. Let me tell you one thing for the last time. The countries in the world where public health institution drives the health system are having better health indices. France, UK, they have it. America, that's the kingpin of privatization, does not have good health indices like these other countries. So Nigerians, we have to question ourselves. Thank you very much for your time. Hopefully we don't have to opt for traditional medicine and the overall healthcare system in the country will be fixed. I hope the policymakers will not drive us to that end. And that's all we can take on today's edition of the program. Join us next week for a fresh edition of the show. I am Sharon Ijasson. Thanks for watching and remember that labor creates wealth.